So um, fantastic. OK, well, thanks ever so much, Adam. Um, that was great. And and so now, uh, folks, coming up, uh, we have David Schwartz here. Um, and uh, David, hello. 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 Hope you can all hear me. We, we, we can do. So I've managed to get this through to the, the fourth guest without losing anybody's audio or video. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uh, amazed here at how well this has gone. But thank you for, for, for coming on and uh, great to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm super excited. I, I would love to do incredibly detailed technical content and I'm excited to do it. But I figured for the first show, something a little more, you know, inclusive for everyone, whether they have a technical background or are familiar with, you know, all the ins and outs of blockchain or not. Uh, I do want to share one amusing thought that came to me though during the demo. Uh, it was funny talking about actually like you know using real accounts and real money in a demo so that someone could actually get paid. Well, we used to have an employee at Ripple named Bob Way, and a lot of you might have heard of him. And you also might know that a common thing to do in a demo is to have Alice send money to Bob. Right. So Bob would always be sure to create an account in every payment system that we ever wanted a demo. So like if we were demoing ODL to Mexico, he would have an account on the place in Mexico. And so if we were showing a demo delivering real pesos being delivered to bob it was bob way who was getting them and uh, i wonder if he ever paid the appropriate taxes on that i, I don't yeah, know all, all the funds that turn up in his account i had a uh, a norwegian friend called mm -hmm. Ger, Ger beckholt and uh beckholt has the uh, norwegian i can't remember what it is but an a and an e conjoined together and he was always i always used him as a test account and i used to do a lot of work about with single sign-on <laughs> systems and integrating with kerberos and stuff like that and so he was always the test user i used to use i used to use his i think he knows this if, if he doesn't he will do it. but um i always used to use his name as a test user because it had you know this weird character in to see to make sure that you know things could could process uh you know non non uh, ascii us ascii characters yeah. so great okay david um Shall we? We've uh, had employees named Alice. I'm sure they'd be a lot less excited about that standard of Alice spending money to Bob. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Where's all my money going? Every month it just disappears for some reason. And this guy Bob's got a brand new car. So. <laughs> so I decided, and nobody but me knows this right now, and I'll share with you that I'm going to talk about how we got where we are and how we got here, Fantastic. which I think, uh, from a technical perspective, uh, one of the things that I often forget is that not everybody's been doing this as long as I, I have. I mean, obviously, I know it on an intellectual level, but like like an example is like I, I still think of Ripple as like an early company with a couple of people working at it. And I forget that, you know, there's more than 500 people and people have been doing this for a decade now. It's been a long time. And so what happens is there's sort of knowledge that you have because of how you got to where you are that people who are just plopped down in the middle of something don't have. And it's... It, it's easy to think that everybody knows it because you lived it. And a lot of people didn't obviously didn't live it. And I think understanding how we got to where we are helps to understand some of the reasons for the way things are done the way they are. It helps you to kind of appreciate, you know, what you have. And so I was going to, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of catch people up on what the experience was like to get to where we are and, and sort of the technical journey that you know what was originally just a new project with no particular name and what eventually became what we now call the xrp ledger cool so i'm gonna thanks i'm gonna start going all the way back to 2011 2012 and, and, and just like what you know that was back when it was jed myself arthur brito and that was pretty much it and we had a vision it wasn't a very detailed or full vision, but we did have a vision. And and I think part of it was just that we were starting to think that proof of work wasn't the magic behind Bitcoin, that proof of work wasn't what made Bitcoin so amazing. It was not egalitarian. Like previously, people had thought that anybody who wanted to could do some mining. Like if you had some extra computing power, you could just mine to make some money. I think we all know that that's completely unrealistic now, that there are people who will be better at it. And it doesn't really deliver decentralization. That's not to say a proof of work system can't be decentralized. It's that it's not going to be decentralized because of the proof of work. The proof of work solves the double spend problem. It is, can do it in a decentralized way, but it isn't what makes the system as a whole decentralized. What we thought made Bitcoin decentralized was the fact that the ledger was public and the fact that all the transactions were public. It's, it was also starting to show up as expensive and inefficient. And I think we all know now that you know, system that there's certainly room for one proof of work blockchain. Obviously, I'm not saying that Bitcoin like would be better if it wasn't proof of work. Bitcoin is what it is, and it's fantastic. But that proof of work is not going to be able to be the be all end all of blockchain. The other thing we realize is that most value isn't on a blockchain. 
a lot of people at the time thought, well, everybody would just use Bitcoin for everything. But even if they do, you still have to get there somehow. Most of the value is in is in things that are other than Bitcoin. So there are going to have to be bridges. Even if you thought Bitcoin was going to take over the world, then you, many people, you still might. You have to get there. But everybody can't just use Bitcoin right now because that's not where the money is. And we didn't think one asset would take over. And even if it did, there would be a long period of time while assets competed. And so we came up with some principles on the basis of that. One of them was to get rid of proof of work, to like come up with an alternative to proof of work. Now, we didn't know at the time whether it would be better or worse. We took the risk that it could be that proof of work was the best solution to the problem and that we would produce, we either wouldn't be able to get rid of proof of work or we would produce a system that was inferior. We took that risk in the hopes that we could produce something big without it. We wanted to preserve decentralization and censorship resistance. At the time, we believed, and I think we still do, that the value proposition for most blockchain projects, at least payments, um, is in decentralization and censorship resistance. But I will point out there is a little crack in that now. Uh, I was experimenting with an NFT platform with some other people, and eventually I realized that like our NFTs were on the Matic blockchain. I have no idea if the Matic blockchain is decentralized. I don't know, does it use proof of work? Does it use proof of stake? Is it federated? I have no idea. My user experience was perfect, you know, and fine regardless. I have no idea what, what like the under, is the underlying technology decentralized? Is it censorship resistant? I don't know. The user experience was great. So maybe for NFTs, that doesn't matter as much. But I think when large amounts of money are involved, when you're talking about payments, I think that is important. Is some evil entity going to try to prevent me from trading my little, my, you know, my, my, NFTs, my little, you know, curiosity things, I'm not worried about it. But if you're talking about my money, I think that's where it's still important. And I think the other thing we realize is that payments are important. Everything that you're doing requires payments. DeFi, I'm going to put money somewhere, that's a payment. I'm going to get a return, that's a payment. Loans, someone, I'm going to borrow money, someone's going to pay it to me. I'm going to make payments on the loan. Payments have to be good. Payments, everything that we want to do requires payments. So we decided that we were going to do cross-currency, cross-asset payments right, and we were going to allow multiple assets to coexist. In 2012, 2013 was the original launch of what we now call the XRP ledger, and it had an enormous number of features even back then. It had consensus, which is a federated Byzantine agreement scheme that's trust minimized. The, the consensus mechanism doesn't tell you what transactions are valid. It doesn't tell you what a transaction does. It doesn't decide who runs the system. It just solves the double spend problem. And it was account-based. While I think a lot of people thought the UTXO model of Bitcoin was simple and, 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 uh, and interesting, accounts fit with more conventional designs. In particular, it's important to be able to manage an account. I'll talk about that more later. Um, and we built a DEX. We built issued assets where you can issue assets denominated in any currency. You can use it for stable coins. You can place offers to trade one asset for another. And we integrated payments with, with an exchange. And that I think is something that a lot of people don't realize that I think is still pretty groundbreaking, which is that you can make a payment that draws on the liquidity of an exchange. So typically exchanges and payments have had sort of different semantics. You place an offer to make a trade, you then find out sort of what happened to your offer. Whereas payments typically have a different flow. You have a specific amount of funds you wanna to deliver to a specific person. We built a very sophisticated engine to merge payments with orders and order books. And those payments can draw on multiple order books to avoid a bad rate, both in series and in parallel. So if I wanna deliver US dollars to someone and I wanna pay with Bitcoin, I could go directly from Bitcoin to US dollars, but I could also go Bitcoin to XRP to US dollars or Bitcoin to ETH to US dollars. And not only can I create these series of multiple order books, if that provides a better rate, but I can also draw in multiple order books in parallel. If you've ever traded on an order book, you know, the larger the volume of your order, the worse exchange rate you get, because you have to you take the best offers first, and then you work your way down. The DEX today um, has around $10 million in confirmed volume per day. What I mean by confirmed volume is volume that I know for a fact is real, because someone can create a worthless asset and move it around a lot, and I don't necessarily know, just like on Bitcoin, like if you look at Bitcoin volume, someone who just wants to be a jerk can move a thousand Bitcoins from account A to B to C to D to E. That could be real commerce and real value, or it could just be someone moving money from one pocket to another. It's very difficult on a decentralized system to confirm that volume is real, particularly when there aren't transact when there aren't proportional transaction fees, right? It's no more expensive on Bitcoin to move a million dollars than a thousand dollars. So it's hard to know, but uh, there's about $10 million in confirmed volume per day that I know is real of multiple fiat and crypto assets. So I'm going to show you the strangest demo ever right now. 
I'm going to demonstrate the absolute bleeding edge latest version of the Ripple desktop wallet from early 2015. All of the functionality that you're seeing was in the 2013 version. This is technology that has been around for eight years now. Uh, and the funny thing is, it is still not ubiquitous. Like when we first developed this functionality and we showed it to people, their minds were blown. They were like, this is the coolest thing ever. And the thing is, we're still not there yet. It's, you know, 2013 was what, eight years ago? We're still not there. So let me share my screen. Yeah, I, I, I find it amazing sometimes. So, so many things that come up and it's like, yeah, the XRP Ledger's had that now for, for, for a while. So uh, um, yeah. Here we go. So there's your, there's your screen size. Cool. Good. So this is the balance screen. And now you notice that this doesn't look at the specifics of the asset. It just looks at what uh, the currency. So for XRP, they're the same. You notice we called everything Ripple back then. It's Ripple open source payments. We all sometimes call XRP Ripple or Ripples. Um, that is that is the coming from the fact that this is the 20, this is a 2015 piece of software that uh, was originally written in 2013. So you're going to see a lot of stuff that, um, you, and I think that's also an interesting thing about path dependence. Like when you see people using terms like blockchain or Ripple, and they're talking, they were writing it in 2013 or 2016, you have to understand that those terms referred to different things uh, than they did than they do now. And I think that's an important that's another important piece of path dependence. So sometimes you'll be reading something that will talk about like the Ripple Ledger and not realize that like that's talking about the XRP Ledger. We we love the name Ripple so much we called everything uh, Ripple back then. So anyway. <laughs> We, like, we just we liked it. It's a good name. It's better I, than I, everything else. I know other, other companies have the same thing as well. I mean, try and work out the name of an IBM product. It's 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 like if in doubt, call it Watson, right? For for ages, seemed to be the <laughs> seemed to be the, the technique. And so there was Watson this and Watson that, and you had no idea what anything did or or, or what it did. So uh, they seem to be changing slowly. But yeah, it's Ripple's not alone in this problem. So the XRP you see is exactly what you think it is. That's how much XRP I have in this account. But you'll notice there's some other things, like I have some Ethereum Classic, um, and here's the issuer. And I have something called some Japanese yen, and I have some US dollars uh, issued by Bitstamp. Uh, I don't have any gold. I have something called Goodwill, which was an experimental currency created just to mess around with a long time ago. Um, and you can see that I can break these down by issuer. So somebody owes me Ethereum Classic. Every asset except XRP is sort of like an IOU on the XRP ledger. And that's the same thing of like a bank balance, right? If you have a bank balance of $1,000, the bank owes you $1,000. Now, one of the interesting things to see here is that I have to decide what assets I want to hold. Um, we don't allow you to just push worthless assets to people. So I've decided that I'm willing to accept payments in US dollars by someone making Bitstamp owe me US dollars. I've decided that I'm willing to accept payments in euros by someone making GitHub owe me dollars. And I have control over the assets that I'm willing to hold. Uh, there is an on-ledger um, decentralized exchange. Here you're looking at the order book. You can see that someone has placed an offer uh, for 15,200 XRP at 40, at 47.3 cents. This is a much larger than usual spread. I wonder what USD I'm looking at. Yeah. But this is the coolest part. So I was talking about how the payment engine and the, um, and the order book are fully integrated. So I could, if I wanted to buy XRP or sell XRP, I could go in here and I could say, I want to buy one XRP and I'm willing to pay, you know, 50 cents and I could push buy XRP and it would do it. And if and if there wasn't, if I said I wanted to, you know, I want to buy XRP for 20 cents, it'll sit on the order book just like any other exchange. But this is the cool part. Say I want to pay somebody money, and I'm going to pay myself money because I know the demo thing, and this is real money, so I'm going to send it to myself. And it's also a more, more powerful idea to think, why would a payment to yourself be useful? Well, I'm going to show you why a payment's useful. Let's say I want a hundredth of an XRP. What the ledger has, what the the system has done is it has actually looked at all of the order books on the ledger and it's composed a payment. So it says I can pay a hundredth of an XRP with 0.004835 USD, which is an implied rate of 0.48352 XRP per USD, or I can pay with 0.00044978 ETC and it gives me the implied rate. Now, if you see here where it says path last updated, what's happening is the ledger is a moving target, it's changing. And the engine is updating the possible ways that I could make this payment. And if I push send, 
what it's going to do is it's going to issue the, the, a sort of complex combination of limit orders. And if you're familiar with working on exchange, you know that like you, could, you couldn't typically place a complex order to say, I'd like to buy 0.01 XRP and I'd like to use Ethereum Classic to do it, but I wanna go through US dollars if that's cheaper. I wanna go through Bitcoin if that's cheaper. This is an implied rate from a synthesis of all the paths that the engine thinks I could take. And if I push the button to make this payment, it's going to issue a payment uh, transaction to the XRP ledger that draws on a combination of order books, both in series and in parallel. And the execution engine will find the cheapest of the paths I specified and increment combinations of those paths to get me the best rate. If I want to send myself 0 0.001 Bitcoin, it will do the same thing. So it found a rate for me using XRP. It found a rate for me using my Ethereum Classic. And it found a rate for me using my US dollars. And I can do the same thing to pay somebody else. So if I want to pay Bitstamp uh, 1 USD. Now you notice this list of assets here. These are all the assets Bitstamp is willing to accept. If Bitstamp is not willing to accept Ethereum Classic, which they're not, I can't send them Ethereum Classic. But apparently, they're willing to accept Japanese yen. So if I want to pay them 0.001 Japanese yen, it will find me paths using my XRP balance, my Ethereum Classic balance, my Goodwill balance, which was an experimental sort of person-to-person -person currency that apparently still has value, or my USD payment, uh, my USD balance. Now, what's also interesting is if I have multiple USD balances and multiple USD assets, so maybe I have USD issued by Bitstamp and I have USD issued by SnapSwap and USD issued by GitHub, it will find me the cheapest route using treating them as equivalent, which an, with it, which order books don't do. And similarly, if they accepted different types of Japanese yen, which I presume they don't from different issuers, it would find me the combination that would give me uh, the cheapest payment. That's the end of the demo part. I think we still have, a, a, well, I don't know. So I could, keep, I could keep going and talk about some of the newer features. I, I do want to at least talk about one feature, which I think is important on the XRP ledger. I'll we'll probably run over time a little bit, but this is important. Remember I was talking before about how the fact that we have accounts as primary objects is like important and meaningful. Well, one of the things that you can do with managed accounts is you can change their properties and you can't do that in Bitcoin. You can create a new receiving address with different properties, but you can't change the properties of an existing receiving address. So for example, if you're a charity and you give out a receiving address and say, hey, if you want to give donations, send them to this Bitcoin address, somebody has to hold the key to that address. Now, you can have multiple keys, but if I hold the key today, I'll hold the key forever. And what that means is that if I'm the person who's responsible for converting Bitcoin into US dollars and suddenly the charity decides, oh, no, they want to hold Bitcoin natively instead, or they want someone else to convert them to euros or whatever, they're going to have to change their receiving address or I'm still going to have the key. If I ever had the key, I'm always going to have the key. What managed multi-signature lets you do on the XRP ledger and the fact that accounts are primary objects is you can change an account's properties. So if you give somebody a receiving address or your charity and you say, hey, you want to send us you know, funds on the XRP ledger, here's the address to send them to. You could accept US dollars and XRP and Ethereum or whatever. You can decide what assets to accept. You can later change the credentials to sign, sign, sign transactions for that account. You can change the keys without changing the receiving address. So if I manage that charity and I do you know, convert all their assets into US dollars and then they decide they want to hold XRP, they can just change the key to one that I don't know anymore. So they can cut me off without having to publish a new address, which I think is pretty significant. Uh, I could keep going forever, but uh, I don't know. I think probably we are at time. Uh, no, that's that's know, great, David. And, uh, and that demo is really interesting. And you know, this is the thing that, that amazes me is like Bitcoin just recently, there's a, a wallet called Strike that has come out that basically does exactly what you have just shown there. Um, mm -hmm you know, now finally and possibly uses the lightning network, maybe um, if that, you know, and it's kind of like, uh, yeah, the XRP ledger has been doing this for, you know, five, six years now. It's, um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. You know, one thing I, I wanted to say also is that like Bitcoin's layer one has been pretty static with maybe like one significant innovation every year or two or so. The XRP ledger has been continuously innovating and adding new features and improvements. I think part of that is the fact that it has the amendment scheme that does that con creates a controlled way to allow that to happen without chaos. But I think also a bit of it is philosophical that like we believe that like innovating to ma maintain technological superiority has has value and that it shouldn't necessarily you shouldn't just say, hey, we're, we're good enough. 
I know one of the one of the interesting conversations I get in with 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 some uh, Bitcoin people is they say, well, XRP's never had any forks, so clearly it's not good, right? And their view is is that a hard fork is a desirable thing because it shows some kind of level of innovation. And I, and I point out to them, no, what it shows is that there was some kind of conflict that could not be resolved in such a way that you then ended up with you know a hard fork and two different forks of the of, of the asset and of the chain. Whereas with the XRP ledger, you have the amendments process. And also the majority of the problems they're trying to solve, the XRP ledger has already solved anyway, the scalability type things, right? So it doesn't need to have those contentious discussions as such. Maybe maybe we'll come up with something contentious in the future to, 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 to have a debate over on the XRP ledger. But um, the amendments process certainly, I think, seems a lot, a lot uh, smoother. Yeah, and if there ever was a contentious change, uh, basically what the governance mechanism is going to come down to is who gets people who run XRP ledger nodes to run their code. You right. know, like if I proposed one one a piece of, let's say I propose a software change, let's say let's add a hundred million more XRP and give it all to me. Yeah, I, in fact, actually, I kind of like that idea. I might actually, why a hundred million? How about you know a hundred? How about another hundred billion XRP that's all mine? Like I could propose that as a change. Yeah, and. The mechanism for me to get people to accept it would be to get people to run code that has the software change that does that. And the mechanism for me to do that would be to build a human consensus, like to get people to agree that that's what they wanted. I think I would have a difficult time getting a human consensus around that. Uh, but if I did, then that's that none of the on-chain governance schemes, like the amendment scheme, because if I can get people to change the code to create 100 billion more XRP and give it to me, I can get them. To, I can change the amendment scheme. I can change the UNL. Right? There's nothing you can't change in the code. Right. XRP doesn't exist in nature. It has no natural properties. All of its properties come from the code and the ecosystem. And so, if you are proposing a code change, there's nothing you can't change. Or you could yeah. turn XRP into Bitcoin. You could propose replacing the XRP ledger software with the Bitcoin software if you wanted. You could propose importing existing balances in if you like. There's nothing that you can't change in the code. And so with and this is true of any public blockchain. Like ultimately, the governance comes down to what do people want it to do because there's no coercive mechanism to make them accept something that they don't want. Weird. Yeah. Exactly. And, and somebody's actually just asked in the chat and said, you know, why do you think people on the crypto community, you know, hate XRP so much? And and I think it's a misunderstanding of, of, of this thing. And I've had a lot of debates with people, uh, you know, coming down to exactly what you just said there, that ultimately, in any decentralized system, it will only and can only ever do basically what the majority or at least the economic majority want the system to do. So if you decide to make a change, anybody can make a change on any system, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, it doesn't matter. If you want to make a change, you can make a change. The code is all there. It's whether yep. you can get a sufficient number of people to also buy into your change such that it is adopted. And I've, I've had similar discussions with people that, you know, we've been talking about, um, you know, side chains and, and um, you know, federated uh, ledgers and stuff like that in the XRP community. And people are saying, well, you know, does that suddenly mean there's there's millions more XRP? And it's like, no, because what we call XRP only exists on the XRP ledger. And that's what we've defined is XRP as a community, as a consensus. And so that means there will only ever be that much XRP unless as a community, as a consensus entirely, we decide to change that. But that is no different yep. from any other system at all. Um, right. Like hypothetically, you know, in the future, if Bitcoin, if Bitcoin mining rate gets unstable and there isn't enough security and people decide that they need the system to be more secure, nothing would prevent a significant super majority of Bitcoin holders and users to agreeing to like increase the mining rewards so that there's more than 21 million XRP. But also nothing would prevent people from saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And the people who decide to print more Bitcoin in the system can't take anything away from the people who don't agree to that. Right. Right. Because there's no coercion in the system. So I can create a new subsystem in which there's more than 21 million Bitcoin and people are free to choose either or both uh, subsystems. And the interesting thing is if you're a Bitcoin holder or an XRP holder and there's a fork, it usually isn't going to hurt you because you wind up with your asset on both sides of the fork. And so whichever side of the fork wins, you're fine. Where it's annoying is the people who want to use the blockchain, because if a significant fraction of the users wind up on both sides of the fork, then you can't reach all of the users on one system anymore. And that's so that's sort of the the pressure against forking is the argument that like the US dollar is more valuable the more people who use it. And that's why like even if New Jersey could, they probably wouldn't want to have their own currency. Right. Exactly. Yeah, network effects and we get into Metcalf's law and all sorts of things that um yeah, you know, if you if you that's strike the bias out against any fork. 
And then yeah. the bias in favor is everybody gets what they want if there's a fork, right? The people who want system X get that, and the people who want system Y get that. And then there's competition between the two systems to capture value. And in theory, what should happen is like the better system should, you know, in whatever sense is relevant, should capture more of the value. But the downside is you lose the network effects. But you also gain scaling, right? Because like each side at least has its own transaction limit. And so at least in that way, you do technically have more capacity after the fork. So this sort of forces in both ways. But yeah, in general, a fork is probably going to suck because of the less of network effect. So in general, there is a sort of community bias against a fork because in general, they tend to be harmful. But at least if you're an asset holder, you're pretty well insulated. Because like once the, once the fork blows over, either both sides will have value, in which case you may be super happy, or one side dies down, in which case the fork is just sort of a blip at that point, and you can just take continue with your assets on the other side. Yeah, indeed. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. Um, so we've uh, kind of just gone gone over our, our hour here. Um, it's been great talking to you. Um, it's been great to hear kind of the history and see the the the, the demo you showed of the uh, of the Ripple Wallet from from way back when. Brand new technology. Brand new, brand new, yeah, brand new in twenty thirteen was it? Most um, probably have never seen anything like that. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Unless you were at any of our demos in 2013, 2014. Yeah, 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 indeed. I, I tried to search for it. I'm sure I saw a demo of it. I think Chris Larson on stage somewhere showing it in back then. And I, I tried to find the video on YouTube and I, I can't uh, find the right incantation of, of search terms to find it. But it was it was great to see it uh, uh, demoed by you. And yet, by all means, it'd be fantastic to to have you on the show again. And, and, you know, we can dive into some, you know, deeper dive into some technical stuff, some code stuff, look at some of the code in the XRP ledger itself, some of the C++ stuff. And um, that would be, uh, that'd be really fantastic. That. Oh, I'd love to do that so much. That just sounds like so much fun to actually like go right to that, dive into the technical stuff. Yeah. But not Brilliant. for the first show. <laughs> not for the first show. No. Hopefully we've, we've given people a... Uh, uh, a, a good sort of spread of, of various sort of topics to, to look at with the speakers we've had. Um, so I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for coming along to, uh, to to the session. Thank you for everybody for for, for um, being here and chatting. Uh, the chat's been fantastic. We've had like 860 people, I think it was last I looked um, uh, online watching this. So uh, for the first show, I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Thank you very much. This has been uh, really, really good. And if you haven't done already, uh, click follow on the Twitch stream. And when we go live, you'll get a notification uh, that we're going live. The idea is uh, to have at least one show a week. And so we'll try and pick a regular time slot. And we'll probably, uh, well, hopefully we'll have several time slots to try and, you know, cover different uh, time zones um, and do a couple of shows a week kind of going forward. Uh, but the idea is to have a, you know, a continual running thing and we'll get people on and we'll be talking technology uh, in, around and on the XRP ledger. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you hopefully in, in, a, in a week's time.